Hey everyone. <sighs> so, my friend shared with me a really great perspective on the word vulnerability. The word, the etymology, comes from the Latin vulnus, so vuln referring to wound, and then ability. It's the ability to be with wound. And I love that. Um, to me, that says that vulnerability is then actually a, a, a skill, right? It's a certain maturity to be vulnerable. It's to be with a delicate, fragile, wounded place inside of ourselves. And in so many ways, this whole human experience as soul and infinite consciousness coming into this very delicate human experience from the get-go, and this is a, a the moon cancer thing, we're vulnerable. Right? We're inherently vulnerable. And hopefully life provides for us the adequate safety to experience that. We need to be cared for, we need to be held. This very delicate, fragile being requires total care, it requires attachment, it requires connection. And there's nothing other than this dance that we are all walking throughout our entire lives in holding not just a balance, because balance can almost speak to like a seesaw balancing ends, but just this artful dancing flow of integration between this fact of soul sovereignty, the soul which is sovereign, it's whole, it doesn't exist inherently in dualities. It is not male or female or anything. It's completely whole unto itself and each soul reflects the wholeness of creation. And then the journey the soul chooses to come into in this duality of all kinds of opposites so we're holding and integrating this dance between our sovereign being and this very real imminent sense of wanting something more. And so we're drawn to connect, we're drawn to share, we're drawn to be vulnerable, to face the parts of ourself that says, I need this, I need more. There's something that's needing to be fed inside of me. Our vulnerability, which is inherent to our human condition, takes us out of any vacuum we might impose upon ourselves. It pushes us into the sometimes messy field of life experience. And I've been saying a lot recently that there's a certain realm on the spiritual journey where your meditation practice, your sadhana, your spiritual practice can't touch we do our inner work and that can make us aware of the terrain, what's in front of us. But there's a level of soul integration that requires us to step into the field of human relationship, which means we have to get in touch with these very human creature parts of ourselves that need that need to feel safe, that need to feel loved and cared for. And then the dance is that journey of, oh, I'm overextended. I'm not in myself. I'm attaching and wanting and I'm not even here. We find that and we come back. We have to face our aloneness. We have to come back to, there's always just this. And we experience the other extreme. We all know what it's like to be on both sides of the coin, right? The one side of wanting something more from someone. And the other side of someone wanting something more from us. And if we can recognize in all of our relationships that while we might in the moment be playing a certain role, be in a certain position, we all know what it's like to be one or the other to various degrees.
And this awareness can open inside of us greater compassion, greater care. It's like, you know, if you're sitting quiet and you're thinking, you'll realize, oh, my shoulders are, sh are shrugged. The body just kind of follows suit with consciousness. In the same way, we can notice, oh, I'm, I'm grasping, I'm uncentered for myself, and I'm, I'm seeking a response from the other, from the environment. We might think that there is a, a sort of a linear relational dynamic occurring, but the body doesn't have a concept of that. And it's when we're just outside of ourself, there's all kinds of abandonment dynamics occurring. It's like we leave ourself, we tense up, we're not breathing. We can't fully process the fullness of this present moment. And then when we're guarded and protected, when we feel like we need to self-preserve and not be taken, when we feel our sovereignty is under attack, we might think, yes, we're defending ourselves from something outside that wants more of us. But the body doesn't have a concept of that. All it knows is that it's not allowed to breathe. All it knows is that it's time to clench up, to become stiff, to become hardened. It stops flowing. Our chi stagnates. There is great art. There's great beauty in studying the unity and the dance of the inner and the outer. Because the, the teaching, the truth is, it's, there's only the inner. There's only what's happening right here. But the whole nature of this evolutionary path is we, we form relationship. We have desire. We want. And so we are impelled to step out into the field and to experience the 10,000 arrays of experiences and to be on all sides of all the coins that exist. And through compassion and awareness, that we're all the same. Right now, Venus is in Pisces. It's moving towards Neptune. So there's a great opportunity right now to see this, to, in a way, open our hearts to a universal understanding and compassion in recognizing that we all wear different clothing. We all put on different forms. We all show up in different relationships in different ways, but there's an underlying unity to this human experience. And the more we open our hearts to that, we live less in our ideas and our concepts and whatever we, may, we might want to do to make it easy. It's like, oh, this person's that. This person's this. They're needing this from me. Or like, nah, they won't give me this. These ways that we actually close our heart. A common human tendency we can talk about Pisces with this, but this is a thing we all do. We all have Pisces in our charts. We all have Venus in our charts. Is to protect our heart, to protect us from our vulnerability. We impose upon life. We impose upon this beautiful thread of oneness, these very concrete rules and judgments and divisions that in a false way helps us to say, okay, well, I can feel good about myself because I've decided that this is what it is. This is who you are. This is who this person is. Whenever we do that, whenever we look upon reality, especially another person, and we decide what they are, we, to ourselves, limit our infinity. We impede the inherent openness and infinity of our own hearts. But what we learn through the intimacy of this human journey and staying fluid, coming back to forgiveness, coming back to compassion, we learn that there is space inside for all of it. That we are quite expansive, quite wide, quite infinite. And that the journey of life isn't necessarily to bring out the ideal forms and relationships that we might be seeking. They may not be there for us. They may not be available. They may not 
have a path in life that will meet us where we want them to meet us and we might not be that for another and so there is letting go there is the facing of okay i opened up i expressed i shared i searched my heart and i can't force anything i can't force anyone if we respect that in others we can respect that in ourselves we can learn to be compassionate, but to not save anyone, just as no one can save us. And that's a Pisces thing that we learn, right? To, to love, to have compassion, but to not mix that with saving someone. Falsely stepping in, making ourselves or making someone else a savior, to take away the necessity, the preciousness of our own death. But to stay open to that too, because we have this idea of ego death that's often really, really harsh. And I think this is a thing that really needs to heal in this world. And our understanding, our perspective of this really reflects the larger patriarchal relationship we have with nature. Right, we have trash and we look upon reality and we see a lot of things that don't decompose or don't break down. But in reality, and even the things that don't break down, ultimately, everything does break down. And when something dies, what's actually happening is the elements of nature meet it. Right? Compost matter on the earth. It breaks down. It's not abandoned. Millions of bacteria and organisms want it, right? It says, I want you. I'm going to take you to the next place. If we don't resist the death, if we don't resist whatever we need to let go of, and how do we know when it's time to die? How do we know? when it's time to let go. It's simple. We can't control anything. We can't make something live that isn't alive. We can pretend. We can make all these agreements. We can force our way. We can attempt to manipulate. We can try to make something someone that we want for them. We could try to make ourselves something someone else wants us to be. But it's just putting a lot of preservatives on, on a hamburger that actually should not be lasting that long. <laughs> Fast food culture. We create food. We create relationships that are protected from death. I don't want to feel the vulnerability of aloneness, of not being wanted. I don't want to feel the pain of you being hurt. So we create so many conditions to protect ourselves from the seeming dread and horror of death. But if we open ourselves to that, and it can be a moment, the next moment can be different. It's okay, this is where things are. I can't, I can't have what I'm wanting now. If we open ourselves to that, we're not abandoned. We're not alone. Because life wants that. Life wants that longing. Life wants that delicateness, that, that vulnerability, that, that deep, fragile heart. It wants to take it. There is so much love in death. And as it goes, the next moment, life is so responsive. It's a dance. And if you've ever been in a relationship with anyone who is kind of with you in that dance, right? Like that way of being where you're not trying to meet one another, but you're here. 
you're also here, where other is encompassed in here. You can have an experience of letting go. And then the very next moment in that letting go, there's actually a space for what wants to be shared to come in. So often we don't allow ourselves to discover the intimacy and the connections in our life that want to blossom because we are not allowing the space for it. Sometimes we need to let go and surrender our illusions, our grasping, our hoping. We need to let that move through us. And only in that space, once we come home, what wants to happen can blossom. It's just a principle of nature. So as, Nep as Venus moves towards Pisces over the next week, and you know, Mercury's just passing through Pisces through Neptune right now, so there's a lot of really potent Neptunian energy. What it does to us is it's taking us into the present moment. It's taking us into the unity of all of us. You know, where we're trying to project meaning on something, where we're trying to make anything or anyone the answer to our loneliness, to our emptiness, or where we're trying to make that for someone else, is where we're getting in the way of this greater truth of spirit that shows itself what it is. And there's a lot of confusion that happens, I find, on the spiritual path because this can be taken in the way of, okay, I'm going to let go. I'm not going to grab. But it can get to the point of not being vulnerable, right? Actually desiring, actually wanting but not allowing ourselves to open up into that, right? Holding ourselves back. It's like a baby that cries for food and, and is told, you can't cry, you shouldn't cry, okay? So then we grow up and, and we tell ourselves, well, I shouldn't, I shouldn't want nourishment from outside of myself. I should find it all within. Just don't work that way. We're not designed that way. It is no sign of spiritual weakness to need. It is natural. And thus it is beautiful. It is art. It is holy. And if we need, then we embrace that, we claim it. And we are completely honest about ourselves, about our condition. Because then if life says yes, or if life says no, we're going to be okay. And the real nourishment actually is in the end. It's a paradox. The real nourishment is our intimacy with all that is on the inside. But we find that we connect to that by embracing our wanting. And it's the embracing, it's the coming to complete terms with who we are and where we are, our full humanness, that we find our wholeness, we find our peace. And if life says, here, I'll give you what you want right now. Or if life says, nothing, you're alone on a desert. There's still a deep clarity and health and alignment and peace that we can access, that we can vibrate because we're not in war with ourselves. And we all learn a faith a deep permeating trust in life, that life is carrying us. What is needed is always provided for. 
There is no such thing as just being left alone to rot, uncared for. That is not a reality. That is not the inherent truth of the universe. Everything is accounted for. There's no waste in life. Nothing's discarded to be outside of the oneness. The 10,000 aspects of the one are in perfect relationship to all of itself. Nothing is ever left behind. And so the peace that we find, whether it's a yes or a no, whether it's now or in a different lifetime, whether our beloved is going to die tomorrow and we're left losing all that we cared and held most dear. It's all inside. And there's nothing inside that is not loved and cared for and met and accounted for by reality, by creation, by creator. In this way, we can look at ourselves, we can look at one another and just see, okay, we are all accounted for. And when we see one another, when we recognize ourselves in one another, when we can meet one another with that awareness of, we're in this dance. And how do you know if you're in a dance with someone? Just by you noticing them. It's that intimate and it's that imminent. There are no extras here. doesn't mean we need to be going around being like, oh, we're one. But it's just a simple recognition that if we're here and we notice it, we're in the dance of the oneness with itself. And the goal of the oneness isn't to settle for two. The goal of the oneness is to be drawn towards the two and to be struck, stricken by the discovery of the one within that. I was listening to the most beautiful teaching from Marianne Williamson today, uh, where she was speaking, quoting something from A Course in Miracles. I, I, and I wanna find this quote. Um, where in A Course in Miracles, there's a passage that says, the way to God is not alone. It's, it's with your brother and sister. It's with your other. We reach heaven together. It's so beautiful. We reach heaven together. There's so much meaning in that. If we think we're doing it alone, if we think our enlightenment is in a vacuum, then who's waking up? Separateness is waking up. It's through the gift of intimacy. It's through the gift of seeing another, of wanting another, of having needs, having desires. It's through the gift of seeing the 10,000 reflections of ourself in everything that we have to realize. We ultimately settle into realizing that we are not alone. It's not even that, it's not even that we can't do this alone or that we're all doing this together, it's that we are together. That's the teaching of all of this. I'm learning a lot right now in my own life about what what partnership means, what what divine intimacy is. It's a very ongoing, it's a beautiful ongoing edge in my own blossoming discovery. You know, we've all heard that, maybe you've all heard that, you know, teaching into me you see. <laughs> and I just love that. I absolutely love that. But I feel that, you know, soul level intimacy, really, really taking a relationship as a path to God, 
is is truly truly a dense it's really being in the unknown first and foremost not holding this objective that says this is who you're going to be for me and this is who i'm going to be for you but even more innocent than that it's being with what's wanted what am i feeling what am i wanting but also what are you wanting what are you feeling what's true here what's actually happening with an open heart balance reveals itself And this tantric dance of desire and letting go. It's constantly saying, I am whole and complete. And I love you. And I'm drawn to you. But I'm not going to possess you. I'm like, oh, there's a little bit of possessing you. Come back here, letting go, dying. And look, you're still there. You didn't create that. They didn't even create that. It's like, if we are just still here and we're not grabbing, that's the oneness naturally emerging. That's life showing up in alignment with the universe. So often we, we really think about relationships in this way of a codependency. And again, it's a codependency or I'm not going to let anyone take me. I think for the most part, and I would say my observations, probably 99 point something percent of the people that I know that are in relationship do not exemplify this way of being. We often categorize our lives in such a way where we have our spirituality and then all of the needs that we want to get met. And so we create a duality where it's like, okay, we're doing our own work, we're cultivating our path. Then there are certain areas where it's like, yeah, but I really need this. And without realizing it, we create a split in our psyche where we think there are things that are not on our path. But when we recognize that everything is on our spiritual path, including our desires for love, for intimacy, for connection, when we see that as one with our awakening, then we find the dance, we find this amazing place of oneness where even the wanting wraps itself back into our inherent wholeness. But when we hold, and there's a subtle judgment in it, when we hold our wanting as a fundamental need that's unfulfilled and I need to figure out how to fulfill it, either it's not fulfilled and I want it or it's constantly, constantly in a, in a battle with accepting the desire. Either way, we hold it as a duality, a problem that's not being solved, an issue that I can't resolve. We don't allow ourselves to be vulnerable. We don't allow ourselves to embrace our humanity and the delicateness of our condition. And it's only when we embrace our innocence that God comes in. In our innocence, life meets everything. My teacher, Jeff Green, has shared once that there's no desire relevant to our evolution that is not fulfilled. And I would even say further, it is not possible to be innocent and pure in meeting yourself and desire something that is unhealthy for you. With innocence, there's so much sincerity and to acknowledge what you want, what you need. But with an open heart, there's so much sweetness in that. There's no space for unhealthiness in that. It's when we're closed off from our innocence and we're craving and we're wanting that we can get into all kinds of situations, entanglements and addictions and ways of hurting ourselves. Okay, so 
talk to you back there.